I'm going to go over tonight is uh, more of an overview of uh, different approaches to integration. Um, this is a very big topic um, and I don't have a lot of time so I'm going to gloss over a lot of things um, and try to leave some time at the end for questions and answers. Um, but um, even with that I'll probably have to leave out a lot of stuff. Um, so <clears throat> how I'm going to actually approach this, um, I'm going to give you guys some things to consider when you're actually trying to think about how you're going to integrate with um, a service. Um, I'm also then going to talk about kind of a high level um, set of different methods that you can actually use. Um, briefly touch on Drupal as an integration platform. Um, and then I'm going to kind of dive into not only what modules you should be considering for integration, but uh, the main crux of the presentation is going to be around trying to identify types of use cases that you guys might encounter and then um, good options for how to actually integrate with them. So um, the first thing, obviously, when you're thinking of an integration um, is looking at the model and, and modeling. And I'm not really talking about this kind of modeling, but we do want to actually have our data look really pretty. Um, so this is actually what I'm talking about when I think of data modeling, um, how your uh, different objects and their properties um, connect. Um, and more specifically, what I want to look at is how you've got two different systems of data and how those actually are going to be equivalent to each other or how they're going to map to each other. Um, so you can see there's a different set of data models and you want to figure out how those are going to map together. That in itself can be uh, a whole exercise just to figure out that. When you're thinking about your uh, data, one of the other important things to understand is what is your source of truth. Um, so just a quick show of hands, when I say source of truth, how many people know what I'm talking about? Okay, a few people. So the source of truth is really more about the source of trust. Um, it's a matter of when you're actually looking at the data and you're going to be pulling data from multiple systems, you want to figure out what is going to be the place of the data that you're going to actually trust the most. Um, so that could be, you know, a canonical source. It can be, um, you might decide that once you guys have actually um, moved data from one location to the other, you're going to discard the old location and the new location is going to be your source of truth. Um, but that's something that you really need to think about is where, what data are you going to trust? The other thing you need to think about is data quantity. So do you guys try to, try to integrate with a small or migrate a small amount of data, a medium amount, maybe a large amount? Uh, and sometimes you're actually swimming in data. Um, and you got to think about that as well. Um, data quality is another important piece. Um, you not only need to think about um, the, the amount of data that you're going to deal with, but when you think about the quality of data, you want to start thinking about um, where are the different points of uh, data that you're going to collect them from and how you're going to potentially have to prepare that data. So <clears throat> some really common things to look out for are things like um, different uh, character encodings, so Unicode, UTF, um, those kind of things. Um, you also potentially want to look at sanitizing your data as well, um, particularly when you're trying to do tests of your data. Um, you want to make sure that you potentially remove any personally identifiable information in your test environments from your production environments, and that's going to be really important. And then the other piece that you need to think about in terms of your data quality is whether or not you're going to pre-process your data or post-process your data. Um, and a lot of people might think that there's not much of a difference, but it's really important when you start thinking about where you're actually going to have your computational load. So, <clears throat> and if you're going to be looking at pre-processing your data, you're generally looking at actually um, modifying your data near the actual source that you're trying to pull it from. Um, and post-processing might be actually transforming or modifying your data once you've actually pulled it to its destination. Um, and of course, there can be multiple steps to that, um, and you might find that you have to do both pre-processing and post-processing, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> the other important thing to understand is um, when you're actually looking at your integrations, you need to also understand what you can actually access. Um, and when I say that, um, particularly when you're going into a, um, a client or, or working with a, in a legacy project, um, you don't always have options about what would be the best case. You know, you might think, oh, I really want this thing to be, you know, real time, I need it to be really responsive, that kind of thing. 
and you actually, when you start digging into it, you realize that the systems that you're trying to pull that data from just don't have those capabilities. And so that's also the other important thing to consider is what, what can you actually access and how can you actually work around those limitations as well. So <clears throat> part of those limitations that you have to understand is what is the acceptable latency of your data. Um, and when I talk about latency of the data, I'm more, I'm more talking about the, um, the freshness of your data. So um, as we'll talk about a little bit later, if you're actually doing um, like batch imports, um, what's the actual time frame between what you're currently looking at, for example, in a Drupal website, and what the external data source might actually be. Um, and you need to understand how, how quickly that needs to be uh, maintained. So you might say, well, uh, it's very similar to actually kind of like a caching mechanism as well. If this data is actually six hours old and it's still valid, and that's okay, that's fine. Um, but some applications might look at six hours and say, well, that's completely, you know, six hours, a lot could have happened. I can only, you know, I need this to be um, less than five minutes old, those kind of things. Um, that's what I mean when I talk about the latency of your data. Um, the other aspect to consider as well is whether you're going to be looking at uh, asynchronous uh, communication or synchronous communication. Um, we'll touch on this a little bit more later, but the main difference between asynchronous and synchronous is whether or not you're able to design your integrations in a way that um, you're not requiring an immediate response from the other component that you're integrating with. So a lot of people think, well, uh, you think like, uh, co most common people think uh, an integration with a web service. And so they think that every time that they're going to request a piece of data, they're going to request it and get an answer back right away. Um, that's not always the case. Um, and that may not always be the best solution either. Um, sometimes you need to be able to either send a request and wait an hour for that to actually come back, or vice versa, um, you're going to actually be getting data at times when you're not expecting them, and you need to be able to handle that. And that's much different than having a synchronous communication where you've actually got this kind of one-to-one -one communication. So the next point that you need to also consider is the robustness of your integration as well. Um, and there's a couple of different aspects when people think about robustness. Um, <clears throat> the, the two main pieces when you consider robustness is reliability, and that's mostly tied to connectivity. Um, so you need to consider in your integration if, if you're actually doing something that is uh, constantly communicating with a different service um, and you actually have that service go down, how is that going to impact your system? And what do you need to do to write in, in your system the ability to handle that? Um, there are some systems, for example, like a payment gateway in an e-commerce system, where if the payment gateway is down, you effectively have to shut the website down or do something else because you can't actually process any orders. And there is nothing you can really do, or there's very few commerce gateways that allow you to effectively buffer your transactions and then send them when the connection's back up. So that's something you need to think about as well. Um, making sure that you have um, good error messages for your users, those kind of things, as well as monitoring tools to detect reliability as well. The other component to robustness is, um, there's a couple bits around this, but the most important one is coupling. Um, so when I say coupling, how many people know what I'm talking about? Uh, okay. So coupling is really when you actually have um, two systems that interdepend on each other, um, where if one breaks, the other breaks, um, or vice versa. Um, and really what coupling is about, um, in most cases, is separating um, your systems in a way that they can ideally operate independently without having uh, negative impacts from the other. Um, and when you do these kind of things, that's really reducing the brittleness of your integration. Um, I'll touch on this a little bit more later, but um, a really common uh, case is when somebody actually decides that they're going to integrate with some other application, and the way to do that is directly integrating with, um, directly writing to a MySQL table. Um, and the problem then becomes is if you don't actually have control over that other application and somebody makes a change to the database structure or whatever else, all of your integration code will either break or you will potentially corrupt an entire application by writing that. That's a very brittle system. 
Um, and that's something to consider when you're, when you're actually looking at this. And of course, the biggest thing that a lot of other people um, focus on, but sometimes needs to come towards the end of the consideration, is actually the performance. Um, when you consider all these other things, you also need to consider the performance of the system. Um, most notably, you want to think about what kind of caching layers you need to have. You also need to consider things like um, how traditional caching mechanisms, mechanisms may actually be interfering with your integration system. So going back to, for example, the latency um, topic, if you've got a caching layer somewhere in between the communication between your application and the other application, and you're not taking that account into your latency, what you might think is maybe an hour's worth of latency, but then there's a six hour cache at the, in, in the middle layer, that doesn't work for you. So that's the other thing that you guys need to consider as well. And of course, network speed as well. Um, there's also things like hard disk speed and uh, those kind of things that can also affect the performance of the overall system that you also need to consider. Um, performance in itself is also a very big topic in and of itself, so I won't spend a whole lot more time on that. Um, <clears throat> so let's touch briefly on what the actual integration methods are. And they come in uh, what I consider five main uh, high-level things. Um, the first one, believe it or not, there are cases where human power um, and manual integration is actually the easiest. Um, there's obviously then file transfer, um, whether you want to do a once-off or batch integration. Um, being able to then also do shared storage or shared databases. So as I mentioned, if you sometimes want to integrate with a database table, um, that can be really easy. Um, remote procedure identification. Um, some of you guys may be familiar with RPC calls. Um, and then what most people actually consider um, as integration is messaging interfaces, so APIs, those kinds of things. So um, kind of gloss over this a little bit, but as I mentioned before, you need to consider whether you're getting your data into Drupal, whether you're getting your data out of Drupal, whether you're looking for some sort of data synchronization. And um, I'll point out here that you also need to consider potentially a middle layer at times. Um, and I'll make a small kind of deviation here to say that Drupal can act as a very good data bus. Once you actually get data in, the fact that Drupal does have a very good structured set of data means that you can actually then turn around and get that data out very quickly, and that makes Drupal a really nice platform for integration. So <clears throat> there's a lot of options here for different Drupal modules. Um, I won't go into each of these, um, but I will point out that there are a couple of um, specific um, kind of modules that you might want to look at um, that have special cases, so node export, um, as well as the user import framework. Um, and then there's also uh, entire categories of modules on Drupal.org that are related to integration. So just jumping into some of these use cases, um, the first one here is if you've got a low data volume, um, once off or infrequent ex imports, um, as I mentioned before, manual data entry can actually be quite easy and people don't often consider it sometimes. Um, the usual rule of thumb is if there's less than an hour or two worth of human labor or, for example, less than 50 nodes that you're trying to import, sometimes it's easy just to copy and paste. Um, there's also the node export module, um, which can be really good for, again, small batches of modules, um, as well as if you want to just have a couple of modules that you need to um, uh, export and import between Drupal interfaces um, uh, infrequently. If you've got kind of a medium data volume, once off or regular imports, um, as I said, file data transfer and processing is probably the main one that you're going to be looking at here. So being able to have things in CSV, um, uh, XML, uh, tab delimited, those kind of things. Um, there's a couple of uh, modules if you've got simple data models. So there's the importer module and more of them will be um, more, uh, more familiar with the feeds module. Um, the feeds tamper module can also give you a little bit of ability to actually process that data before it gets into Drupal. And if you're looking for more complex data models or doing large batching, the migrate module is probably the most appropriate for a lot of things. Uh, low, medium, or low to medium data volume and once off or regular export. Um, the views data source allows you to actually pull data from your different um, content types and actually export it in a, uh, a format that can be easily uh, ingested. 
You can also kind of grab the actual HTML, um, and that's an option for a lot of times to actually pull the content in. Uh, and I'll also point out that you can also use SQL procedure calls sometimes when you're trying to do these things as well. Um, medium data volume, regular exports, um, and particularly also when you're looking at real-time access. Um, the services module, which somebody else will be talking about a little more tonight. Um, and again, views data sources can actually be relatively good if you don't cache the views. And I, I make a small point. Um, coming from a robotics background, real time in, my, in that industry has a much different meaning to real time in the web. So I consider it near real time access. Um, there's two main areas that you want to look at there. Um, storage or database sharing, which is the most common version. Um, Table Wizard and Data Module both have similar kind of features. Um, they allow you to actually um, take a module and actually export it into a uh, into views or uh, access it to other things. Um, hook node save is also really handy if, for example, you're actually trying to get data from Drupal into a different system. Um, you can write a little custom module that actually hooks into the node or other objects within Drupal and actually save them to a different database in a way that you want to use them. Um, but I'll remind people that direct SQL manipulation can be quite brittle and be careful about the coupling of those systems. So I'm almost done. Um, the last part to the near real-time access is actually the message passing. Um, and that's where most people actually consider integration. Um, so you, at that point, you're looking at SOAP interfaces, REST interfaces, JSON, um, also looking at webhooks. Most of these are going to involve a custom module, although there are a couple of helper modules for these kind of interfaces. Um, if I had a bit more time, I, I'd also give you guys some pointers on how to actually design an API around other services that you can actually use as a way of decoupling systems. Um, but if anybody's interested in that, I can talk about that later. Um, and for any further questions or further details, I recommend a couple of these books, uh, particularly the Enterprise Integration Patterns. And Microsoft's Integration Patterns book is actually a free download, um, and it's got quite a bit of good information in it. Um, and that's it for me. Questions while John comes up and gets set up. Yeah. So. Okay. Any questions? Answered them all, huh? Okay. What's the best way to integrate one Drupal site with another Drupal site? The best way to integrate one Drupal site with another site. Um, there's a couple of, of answers to that, and it really kind of depends on what you're trying to integrate between the two Drupal sites. Um, I didn't put it on my slides, but I'd point out the deploy module. Um, a lot of people like to use that for it, kind of migrating or integrating things be between two Drupal sites. Um, I'd also suggest the services module works pretty well for a lot of that stuff as well. Um, so yeah, um, happy to talk to you about your specific use case though. That's probably the easiest way. Ryan, what would, if, given the choice, what would you choose if you had very, very large amount of data, a third-party data source, what would you choose yourself if you had the choice of, of just using SQL, doing an SQL feed, or programming, or using a programmatic approach? Um, to some extent, this is all really case-by-case -case basis, so it's hard to sure. give a good answer to that. I would generally want a programmatic interface to those options as much as possible, um, unless I had a lot of control over the SQL database of the other application, and I knew that I could actually prevent yeah. coupling. If you, if you knew the data was pretty well structured, and you were confident, then you might favor SQL in that situation. It's, n it's actually not about the structure of the data, right. it's actually about the stability of that data. And, and how, how much control I have over that other application. So um, the, the nice thing about having a programmatic or an API uh, interface to that is that the, the API can be stable and the other application can change and whatever else and the API doesn't have to change. And as long as I make sure that the other person uh, update the APIs to continue to work when they make their changes, I don't have to worry about their data, their data structure. I just have to worry about the API interface. And that's, that's the worry there with the coupling. Yeah, maybe you want to catch up afterwards and like, yeah. discuss some more detail. Right, thanks very much. And um, next is...
A horror story from John, I believe. <laughs> Not really, but uh, yet there. And that's yeah.